Welcome everyone. I'm Johanna and I'm the Public Programs Manager at SAMA. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our first lecture for our special exhibition, No Ocean Between Us, Art of Asian Diasporas in Latin America and the Caribbean from 1945 to the present. It is currently on view. So if you haven't seen it, please, please check it out. And if you have seen it, it's pretty incredible, right? Um, as with all lectures, our guest scholar will present around 40 to 45 minutes and the last 15 to 20 minutes will be Q&A. Throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll get to it at the end of her lecture. Now, without further, further ado, here is our Acting Associate Curator of American and European Art, Yinshi Lermontan. Thanks, Johanna, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for this first exciting program um, for our exhibition, No Ocean Between Us, uh, which was rescheduled because of the storm. So thank you, everyone, for um, sticking with us. And uh, here we are tonight. And um, this, I wanted to mention that this lecture is underwritten by the Bank of America Fund for Latin American Lectures. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Evelyn Hu de Hart. Dr. Hu DeHart is a professor of history, American studies and ethnic studies at Brown University, where she was also the director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity uh, from 2002 to 2014 and director of the Consortium on Advanced Studies in Cuba. She has written, edited and published 11 books in four languages on five continents on topics including indigenous peoples in the US Mexico borderlands, the Chinese diaspora in Latin America and the Caribbean, and race relations and minority politics in the United States. Her publications on Chinese diaspora include edited volumes such as Across the Pacific, Asian Americans and Globalization, Asians in the Americas, Transculturation and Power, and um, Afro-Asia, among many others. And her essay, which is titled Empires, Island and Diaspora, Chinese in the Caribbean is featured in the exhibition catalog um, for our exhibition, which is available for purchase at the museum gift shop. She is currently collaborating on two public humanities um, and digital humanities projects, uh, one at Brown and one at Stanford. Um, and she speaks several languages, including English, Chinese, French, and Spanish, and has taught, researched, and lectured globally and throughout the US, um, throughout the US, Latin America, and Asia. We are very excited also to Zoom welcome her back to Texas, where she did her PhD in Latin American and Caribbean history at UT Austin, uh, and after which, um, which was after she received her BA in political science from Stanford. I'm particularly excited to have Dr. Huda Hart with us tonight because in so many ways, uh, her work as a scholar has really laid the historical and theoretical groundwork that undergirds this exhibition. Her scholarship redefines history to be relational, hemispheric and transnational. And she focuses in her words on people without history or whose stories have been quote, hidden, lost or marginalized including the stories of Asian diasporas in Latin America and the Caribbean. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Hu de Hart. Wow, thank you, Dr. Lermontan, for that generous introduction and for inviting me to speak at the museum and to Johanna Tespe for log logistical support. It is an honor and a great pleasure to be here tonight. I can't see you, but I assure you that I can feel your presence. I hope all of you, wherever you are, are coping well with the pandemic. And to the Texans among you, I hope you have your electricity and water back. To the Asians and Asian Americans who are here tonight, I hope you have not had to deal with racist attacks which have terrorized many of our communities. What a year it has been. Now that we have practically hit rock bottom, life can only get better, I hope. I would like to wish you also a happy Lunar New Year, Year of the Ox. A little belatedly, I'm afraid, when we originally planned this lecture for February 19, 
it would have been in the midst of celebrating Chinese New Year, which many other Asians also celebrate. So let's celebrate tonight with stories I will share with you about Asians in Latin America and the Caribbean. I venture to guess that you will find most of these stories about Asian peoples and communities eye-opening, surprising, unexpected, and most importantly, informative, instructive, enlightening, and educational. After the lecture, we have some time to entertain your comments and take your questions. Let me get back. So what do we know about Asians in the Americas? Well, let's think about the United States. Some of you know something about Asians in the United States, especially Chinese and Japanese. We know Chinese came to work in the gold mines and to build a transcontinental railroad in California and the West in the 19th century. You may have heard of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which restricted further immigration of Chinese laborers to the United States. You might know that during World War II, the US government rounded up many tens of thousands of Japanese American families and incarcerated them in concentration camps. So Chinese panning for gold, Chinese building the railroad, Japanese American families in concentration camps. But what about Asians in Latin America and the Caribbean? Can you immediately conjure up a name, a face? Well, I'm here tonight to tell you that Asians are hidden in plain sight all over Latin America and the Caribbean and have been for centuries. And by many, I am thinking not only of numbers, but of a great diversity of occupational and life experiences through centuries of time and over a wide territorial range. Let me start by reminding you that linking Latin America to Asia is not at all far-fetched. After all, Columbus was heading to Las Indias, to Asia, when he got lost in unknown islands and lands soon named America. Seeing Asians everywhere in Latin America is a theme tonight and of the exhibit. So to pique your interest and whet your ap appetite for the art exhibition, and in the little time I have with you, let me start by presenting a gallery of interesting faces of Asian diasporas in Latin America and the Caribbean, representing notables and commoners. They are laborers, businessmen, and industrialists political leaders, religious figures, writers, and artists. And diaspora is a fancy word for immigration to many parts of the world. And we'll come back to this concept later. So here's a world map, of circulation of people. And this is the area that we're gonna concentrate in, Latin America, the Caribbean. So one of the earliest Asian immigrants was this Japanese Christian called Luis de Encio who became a leading businessman in Guadalajara, Mexico, when in 1620s to 1640s. He was a samurai of the warrior class of Sendai, Japan, a converted Christian who fled to Mexico to avoid persecution in Japan. In Guadalajara, he became a financial advisor to the Catholic Church and married a fellow Japanese immigrant, Juan de Pais, among his many businesses was the following. I'm, I'm getting trouble getting this arrow here. Just a minute, here we go. Look at, look at what we found in the archive. I have a contract signed by Luis and Seal in Japanese, as you can see, with his Mexican business partner to make tequila in Mexico. And this contract was signed in 1624, proof positive that there were Japanese in Mexico in 1634. The earliest known Asian woman to immigrate to Latin America was an enslaved Muslim girl named Mira from the Mughal Empire of India. She arrived in Mexico in 1619. Then as Catarina de San Juan, she died a Beata or Catholic lay saint in Puebla, Mexico 
memorialized in popular culture as a Latina poblana. The Chinese in Mexico were the original illegal aliens crossing the Sonora Desert to the US. Upon passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, Chinese began migrating to Northern Mexico at first uh, to try to cross the border surreptitiously to the US, but most stayed starting small businesses in mining and railroad towns all along the border, such as this family who you can see the wife is, is Mexican and they have three lovely children. This photo was taken when they went back for a visit to China. Chinese crossing the Mexican border to the US oftentimes posed as Mexican businessmen because of the Exclusion Act, they were not supposed to be in the US. But having lives and businesses on both sides of the US-Mexican border has given meaning to the practice of being transnational, transporter, and in the, in the Spanish of Mexico, un fronterizo. In the early 20th century, Li Kuang with his wife Lai Nang and their eight children settled on the border in Nogales, Arizona. They grew cotton and grew prosperous. And here I have a lovely photo of Lai, Lai Yang and her American neighbor and friend, Doña Garcia, who's a Native American woman. One very special group of Chinese in Northern Mexico were called the Persian Chinese. There were about 300 of them in Chihuahua, Mexico, which is across from Texas, paid by the US military to take care of General John Pershing's soldiers in a punitive expedition to catch and punish Mexican revolutionary Pancho Villa in 1916. When Pershing evacuated Mexico without Villa in 1917, he took these Chinese men with him and they soon settled in San Antonio, Texas, San Antonio, Texas and became the basis of the foundation of the Chinese community in San Antonio. Moving back to the Caribbean, I want to introduce you to Arthur Chung, who was the first president of independent Guyana in 1970 to 80, the native born son of Chinese immigrants. He had a distinguished career as lawyer and judge. Guyana is located on the Caribbean coast of South America, next to Venezuela, and gained its independence from Britain in 1970. Here's Chetty Jagan, Prime Minister and President of Guyana from 1992 to 97. He was the son of Indian indentured laborers and he is beloved as a father of the nation. And of course, we have Alberto Fujimori or Fujimori as the Peruvians would pronounce his name. He was President of Peru for 10 years from 1990 to 2000. Even though he was known as a son of Japanese immigrants, he was nevertheless nicknamed El Chino, a term used to denote all Asians, as we will see, since the first ones arrived in the early 17th century. He later on faced corruption charges and is now imprisoned in Peru. The Mexican politician Miguel Angel Osorio Chong was a governor of the state of Hidalgo and then recently the cabinet secretary of the interior or gobernacion, which is the most powerful cabinet post, a step away from the presidency. Osorio Chong's mother was Chinese. And now I introduce you to Ryoki Inoue, the Japanese Brazilian and Brazil's most popular author of 1,075 books and counting. He was trained as a throat surgeon and he writes about love, war, cops, spies, science fiction, and oftentimes goes, goes, was a ghost writer to famous Brazilians. The Guinness World Record lists him as the world's most prolific writer of 1,075 books and counting. We, I want to introduce you to V.S. Naipaul, an Indo-Trinidadian and the winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. And I highly recommend his wonderful book, House for Mr. Biswas, which depicts the life 
of Indian and Chinese Trinidadians. Here's my friend Trinidadian Chinese artist and filmmaker Richard Fong and his Afro-Chinese cousin Mavis, who in this picture, in this photo, was 90 years old. Jose Watanabe is a well-known and acclaimed celebrated Japanese Peruvian poet, and Pedro Shimoze is a Japanese Bolivian poet. Siu Gam Wan, or Jose Siu, is a wonderful short story writer of Peru. Now, all of these uh, writers I just introduced you to, of course, write in Spanish. I want to introduce you to Ana Gabriel, beloved popular Chinese Mexican singer. Any of you who know Norteño music of Mexico, you would surely know about Ana Gabriel. And here, I love this photo because it's Ana Gabriel in her Chinese best. Here are some, a Korean family in Cuba today, Cristina Chang and her brothers Armando and Eduardo in Armando's house in Baradero, Cuba, taken in December 2015, Koreans in Cuba. And I have some old photos of Japanese in Mexico, in Northern Mexico, most of them settled. Some of them were forced into concentration camps in Mexico during World War II, much like those in the US. Here I introduce you to a Chinese Mexican businessman called Wong Fung Chuck. Here's a photo of Wong and his family in the states of Coahuila and Tamaulipas, two states across from Texas. This is in the early 20th century. He was a very forward thinking modern uh, industrialist and here we see Wong's hacienda or agricultural estate, which he named Canton in Tamaulipas, border state with Texas. And here you see his modern machinery. And Wong even built a modern school, escuela for boys and girls in Coahuila state across from Texas. Here is a, um, a very wealthy, Afro-Chinese Jamaican, a billionaire and a philanthropist. Michael Lee Ching, as a son of Father Lee and Mother Ching, both of whom were also Afro-Chinese. Peruvian Chinese businessman and industrialist Aurelio Pausancha made his fortune in Peru in the early 20th century. And here I put together three photos of Aurelio with his Peruvian wife in the top photo and his son and grandchild. And you can see the luxury of his home, the sitting room and the dining room. And here is his hacienda of the Paulon Company, the agricultural estate and the factory that's on the estate. Now I bring you to the modern day to a Chinese bazaar in Sao Paulo, Brazil. These bazaars are huge popular markets, both open air and also indoors. And here I just took a photo of one of the shopkeepers who represents the thousands of Chinese, new Chinese immigrants who have come to do business in cities all over Latin America. And they stock their stores with merchandise sourced from China. Here I introduce you to Jose Ong. Jose Ong is an Afro-Chinese Lukumi priest of the Cuban Santeria or the Afro-Cuban religion in his studio in Regla, Cuba today. And of course, we cannot finish this lecture without highlighting Wilfredo Lam, the world renowned Afro-Chinese Cuban artist. More on him later. So let's summarize this history. I hope you have enjoyed meeting these Asians in Latin America, the Caribbean, from the early 17th century to the present. Behind each is a story of how and why their families arrived in the region, their life histories and histories of their communities, as well as, yes, very importantly, their interaction with other ethnic and racial groups and communities. What ties them together? 
is a long and enduring history of Asian diasporas to Latin America and the Caribbean. I have identified five Asian diasporas and I would like to go over each of them tonight with you by way of wrapping up this discussion, this lecture. Again, the word diaspora is a word suggesting immigration from one source to many desperations throughout the world. So the first diaspora I have identified, I call them Filipino diaspora. This is a very early one in the 17th to 18th century. When Columbus set sail westward across the Atlantic, across the Atlantic, remember, he was heading to Las Indias, to Asia, but he landed on unknown territory later named America. From there, New Spain or Mexico, Spaniards did reach Asia in the early 16th century and colonized the archipelago, the chain of islands they named Las Filipinas after the Emperor Felipe II and made Manila its capital. Manila was made an extension of its American colony of New Spain or Mexico. New Ma from Manila, Spaniards launched the 250 year old global trade directly from across the Pacific from Manila to Acapulco, Mexico, exchanging silver mined in Mexico and Peru for high quality mass manufactured luxury and consumer goods, notably silk and other textiles, porcelain, spices, furniture, and ivory rel religious figures. People also sailed on the galleons across the Pacific in both directions. And this is astounding, I think. An estimated 40 to 60,000 to as many as 100,000 Asians of many backgrounds went from Manila to Acapulco, Mexico, and from there spread out throughout the vast Spanish American empire. So this is the Manila Galleon route, no? From Manila to Acapulco, Mexico, and back again. And people went in both directions. As many as 100,000 Asians made their way across in the 17th and 18th century. So people from all over Asia and India flocked to Manila to trade with the Spaniards. Some of them took passage on the galleons on their return voyage to Mexico. And from there, many went to Central America, to Peru and other parts. So here I have a lovely painting of some of the Asians in Manila who might have taken passage on the galleons to Mexico and from there all over the Spanish empire, today's Latin America. And here in this, you can see the Chinese and you can see many different types of native Filipinos. So among those Asians who came to Spanish America, to Mexico and Peru, were Chinese Christian businessmen like Luis and Cio and enslaved Asians like Mira Catalina de San Juan or La China Poblana. You have met both of them tonight. Most of these early immigrants were probably natives of the Filipino islands. For example, Tagalog speaking Pampansingan of the big island of Luzon. They were humble men and women who merged with local peoples of Mexico and Peru intermarried and integrated into their communities, becoming part of the local social landscape of early Latin American society. Among the things from home they introduced to Mexico was a palm tree and the tuba wine made from coconuts, which are now a staple of local culture of Mexico's Pacific coast. The historical archives record these early Asian immigrants as Indios, sometimes as Chinos, which as you will see later, remains a generic term for all Asians, not just people from the country of China. In fact, I already told you that the nickname for Fujimori, president of Peru, who is son of Japanese immigrants, is 
nicknamed El Chino. What happened to these early Asian immigrants? As I said, as Indios and Indios Chinos, they married into local society, emerged into the early societies of Spanish America. No traces of them have survived as distinct Asian communities. But as I said just now, their presence continues to be visible and felt in other ways. I mentioned some of the food that they brought over and introduced into the local uh, food practices. But most importantly, it's the material culture that they brought over from Asia that have remained a large part of Latin American society today. So let me in, uh, show you some examples of Asian material culture found all over Latin America and the Caribbean. Here is an oil on canvas of the Countess of Monte Blanco. What is she wearing? She's wearing a Western style dress, yes, but the dress is made of Chinese silk embroidered. Here is another painting that hangs in the Denver Art Museum. Another rich lady of Spanish America wearing a dress made of Chinese silk. This is an ivory statue of the beloved Santa Rosa de Lima. Thousands of these figurines were made, exported to the Americas or brought over to the Americas and sold everywhere, as is this polychrome ivory of St. Geronimus. A nice piece of lacquer furniture made by a Chinese artisan and brought over to America. And of course, these, this is a fine example of the porcelain. Uh, this is a very early example, 1600s in the late Ming Dynasty. And look what we have. We have in Mexico now the Talavera blue and white pottery, which was copied from Chinese pottery. And finally, I want to show you this wonderful example of syncretism or intercultural mixing. This is a figure of the Chinese goddess of mercy, Guan Yin, but she's holding a baby in the style of the Catholic Madonna. And this, this beautiful ceramic statue is made in China and exported to America. So there are thousands of pieces of Chinese and other Asian material culture, but mostly Chinese, that you can find in many private homes in Latin America today, in practically all the churches in Latin America today, and of course, in many, many museums. The second diaspora I have identified, I call the South Asian diaspora, 19th to 20th century. The first South Asian was the aforementioned Mira, Catarina de San Juan, who was enslaved and brought to Mexico and died a Catholic lay saint. But it was not until the early 19th century when large numbers of South Asians, mostly men, but some women, were recruited to the British Caribbean as indentured laborers under five-year contracts to work the plantations in Guyana, Trinidad, Jamaica, to succeed freed slaves who fled the plantations to plow their own small plots in freedom. By the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, half a million or more South Asians from British India had migrated to the British Caribbean as contract laborers, commonly labeled coolies, constituting a vast migration within the vast British empire. You have met some of their descendants, the great novelist V.S. Naipaul of Trinidad, the winner of the Nobel Literature Prize, and Guyanese Prime Minister Chetty Jagan, beloved as father of the nation. The third diaspora is a Korean diaspora in the 19th and 21st century to this day. Koreans did not begin to arrive in Latin America until the middle of the 20th century during the war and post-World War II years, when Korea became divided into two countries at war with each other and their economies in shambles. Many Koreans immigrated to South America at this time, the middle of the 20th century, to Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, and to Mexico as well. 
But in South America, they established a textile clothing industry of small to medium manufacturers. But there was a small group of Koreans, just over 1,000 men and some women, who were sent to work in the Yucatan of Mexico in 1905 as indentured laborers for the Henneken plantation. Henneken was valued as a fibrous plant to make rope for international harvester binding machines. In the 1920s, about 300 of them migrated to Cuba to start Henneken cultivation there for the sugar industry of Cuba. And here, I want to introduce you to this Cuban Korean or Korean Cuban community who are still in Mexico living uh, in their communities. This is a photo uh, that I borrowed from Tajimaris Ruiz Sanchez of Cadenas, Cuba, a descendant of this early Cuban Korean family who did not migrate to Cuba directly from Korea, but had re-migrated from the Yucatan in Mexico to Korea. Here's a, another photo of this early family. And of course you have already met the, the Christina Chang and her brothers who live, as I say, in Cuba today. This is a very recent photo. The fourth diaspora is a Japanese diaspora, 19th century to the 20th, except of course, there was Luisi and Siu, who I put under the early Filipino diaspora. Luisi and Siu, a handful of Japanese did arrive in Mexico very early on in the 17th century and merge into the local population. So we don't have a clear linkage to this very early uh, Japanese immigrant community in Guadalajara, Mexico. But large scale Japanese migration to Latin America did take place in the 19th century, accelerating in the pre-World War II decades of the 20th century. This migration was organized as joint ventures between the Japanese government and Latin American countries, notably Brazil and Peru, to resettle Japanese immigrant families with land. And here we have, okay, in South America, you have already met Alberto Fujimori, as I said, nicknamed El Chino, the son of Japanese immigrants. You met Ryoka Inoue, the most highly published writer in the world. And today, Brazil has the largest community of Japanese descendants outside of Japan, more than in the US. And like those in the US, many Japanese in Latin America were rounded up and interned in concentration camps during World War II, like the Japanese in Northern Mexico that you met. But I should mention also that the US government went all the way down to South America to Brazil and to Peru and rounded up Japanese from those countries and brought them to the US to be interned in concentration camps. Alberto Fujimori. Now the fifth diaspora, the last diaspora is also the largest and a continuous diaspora. This is a Chinese diaspora. The Chinese were among the first immigrants as some came during the Filipino period. But mass Chinese immigration across the Pacific began in the mid 19th century to California and the American West, as you have seen, to Cuba and the Caribbean, to Peru and South America. You know about the migration to the US West uh, to work in gold mining and build a railroad. By the way, the transcontinental railroad was authorized by President Lincoln while fighting the Civil War to keep the Union together and to abolish slavery. The Chinese went in large numbers to Cuba and the Caribbean and to Peru in the mid 19th century as indentured workers for plantation labor. Then they turned their attention to Northern Mexico during the late 19th century when the US shut them out with passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I showed you that wonderful graphic image of the Chinese crossing the Sonoran Desert of Mexico as the first illegal alien. 
Since the late 20th century and continuing to this day, large numbers have been migrating to every Latin American country, primarily for trade and local commerce to large cities such as Mexico City, Lima, Peru, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I showed you the huge Chinese bazaar uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil today. So most of the Chinese uh, originated from the Southern um, Chinese uh, province of Guangdong or Canton province. No? Those who went to the Caribbean were a sub-ethnic group of South Chinese called Hakas. Now, the Chinese who went from South China to California, to Mexico, to Central America, to Peru, and to Canada, crossed the Pacific like the galleon ships of previous centuries. But those Chinese from South China who went to Cuba had a far longer and more difficult and arduous voyage because they had to cross the entire Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean to reach the Caribbean. So this was a much more difficult voyage. Here are the Chinese. Actually, this photo is of Chinese plantation laborers or contract laborers, also called coolies, in a Louisiana plantation because those Louisiana plantation owners who had lost their slaves after abolition brought some of them over from Cuba to work in Louisiana. Here we have another photo of a late 19th century plantation. This one owned by a Bostonian who worked on his sugar plantation. Here's another photo of a sugar of a Chinese laborer on the sugar plantation carting uh, uh, a cartload of sugar cane to the refinery. And here we have a, a, a sketch of a Chinese coolie on a Cuban sugar plantation who was setting fire to the cane fields in rebellion. And here is a wonderful photo of a Chinese mambise or a freedom fighter who helped the Cubans fight for independence from Spain. So the Chinese in Cuba had a very illustrious history uh, as freedom fighters. And they came with these contracts, very unusual contracts because the contracts were bilingual. This is a Spanish version of the contract, which says that they were immigrating or emigrating from China to Cuba. But look, here is a Chinese version of the contract, but it doesn't say anything about immigration. It says, and I circled if you read Chinese, that it's a voluntary labor contract overseas. And that is because by Chinese law under the Manchu or Qing dynasty, it was illegal for a Chinese to immigrate, that is to abandon his homeland. But because of the worldwide demand for cheap Chinese labor in the Americas especially, but also in Southeast Asia, the Qing government, the Manchu government relented and allowed Chinese to leave home in order to work overseas. To conclude, I ask, is there an emblematic Asian Latin American, someone who captures the heart and soul of being Asian and of Asian heritage in Latin America and the Caribbean, someone who captures the distinctiveness of being Asian in a multicultural world, multiracial world, built by native peoples, European conquerors and settlers, African enslaved peoples, Asian and other immigrants, who might that emblematic Asian Latin American be? So I introduce you again to Wilfredo Lam, the emblematic, for me, Asian Latin American. No, Wilfredo Lam, the world-renowned Afro-Chinese Cuban artist. Wilfredo Lam was born in Cuba. Of, he, he, I, I have to put this on because he was a great friend of Pablo Picasso. This is taken in uh, Spain with a bullfighter. All right, Wilfredo Lam's father was Lam Yan. He was already quite elderly, who married his mother, Ana Serafina. His mother was 
described as a mulata, that is an Afro-Cuban. No? Here are two of Wilfredo Lam's six sisters, Sara and Luz. And they lived on the street, Cocaye Tacon, in the middle of the Barrio Chino or Chinatown in their little town, hometown of Sagua La Grande, which is in the middle of the sugar district. And here is a front of the Chinese association of that town, Sagua La Grande, Calle Tacon. So what was Lam's hybrid upbringing like? First of all, he always kept his father's surname, Lam, and never added his mother's surname, though it was common practice to add mother's surname after father. Castillo was his mother's surname. He never used it. He was proud of his literate father, his father, who was quite elderly when he was born, but whom he described as muy culto intelectualmente y sus paisanos le tenían mucho respeto. He says his father would write letters and often wrote letters for other Chinese in Sagua La Grande who didn't know how to write. So he said his father was very well educated and much respected by his compatriots. In Sagua La Grande, Wilfredo Lam grew up among the Chinese community, most of whom were also of mixed parentage. For example, his, the shopkeeper Guillermo Glenn, whose maternal, maternal grandfather, I, excuse this typo, I meant maternal grandfather was Chinese, and whose mulata black grandmother was Refredo's godmother. So besides his parents, Refredo and his siblings grew up surrounded by other Afro-Chinese. They seemed to be the norm. In the barrio, he learned to eat Chinese food and learn some Chinese words. But the greatest cultural influence on Refredo Lam was probably his maternal aunt, the mulata manat, man, Mantonica Wilson, Mantonica Wilson, who was a Lukumi priestess or Santera of the Santeria religion. And she infused with Fredo with the Afro-Cuban cultural and religious beliefs and iconography so central to Wilfredo Lam's artistic expressions of Afro-Cubanidad. So it was perfectly natural then that the Cuban who gave the greatest expression to Afro-Cubanida should be an artist of mixed Chinese and African heritage. Here is Mantonica Wilson, the Lukumi Santera or priestess of the Santeria religion. Here is uh, Wilfredo Lam's famous painting called The Jungle. His paintings hang in all major museums of the world, including New York's Metropolitan Museum. And I believe you will see his paintings in the ex exhibition at the uh, San Antonio Museum. When I brought this painting, a copy of this painting to China, the Chinese tended to see this as bamboo, while in Cuba, they recognize this as sugarcane. And here, some of the art historians, I don't know if Dr. Lerman Tan would uh, agree, they say that they see some Chinese brush strokes in this painting of Wilfredo Lam. And again, I remind you, I have already introduced you to another Afro-Cuban, Jose Ung, who is also a Santera or a Lukumi priest of the Santeria religion. So not surprisingly, the post-immigrant generations of Chinese in the Caribbean, I'm gonna conclude with this, very quickly uh, is um, like Regina Pedroso, no? celebrated Afro-Chinese Cuban poet. He is described by his fellow Cuban poet, Nicolas Guillen, as having blood flowing through the veins. Nicolas Guillen says of uh, Regina Pedroso's blood, here one see it, the blood, flow like a wide and slow river whose waters pass through Asia and Africa before arriving in Cuba. And two other artists that are in this exhibition are um, the Afro-Jamaican 
photographer and installation artist called Albert Chong. Here is his uh, uh, one of his works named after his aunt and Willie, his sisters, the sisters. And here's Sybil, Sybil Atek, a painter of Trinidad. This is entitled Laborers. And here is Sybil Atek's self-portrait. Well, my time is up. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias por su atención. Thank you very much.